expression about what they think might be offensive. But it's hard to craft any sort of regulatory statute or, or, or regime around something that's as vague as that. And that's been the great failure of the FCC. It has replaced vague words with more vague words. Um, so finally, what is, I think, the, my last point, what is this all about? I do think this is about uh, a concern for a, a time gone by. Uh, two quotes from your book. Uh, Every civilized culture must be governed by some standard of civic prudence, some ability to constrain its latent vices and keep its indulgences and weaknesses in check. So that sounds to me like Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, the freedom and ability to censor can be a powerful means of advancing the reach of civilization. So don't think that he's not a proponent of censorship in its uh, most basic forms. Um, and I'll stop there.
I had a question. Um, I was surprised. I mean, we're all a lot of us are working on this, uh, you know, Phelps v. Snyder case for appellate advocacy. And during my research, I was surprised to find uh, a lot of examples pre uh, adoption of the First Amendment and post uh, that adoption laws restricting speech. That was a surprising thing that I learned. This because this question is Professor Fairman. Are, if we say that there is no censorship whatsoever, are you not rewriting kind of what, or giving a new meaning to what the First Amendment means? I don't know what your comment. I don't buy into the whole notion that we have to figure out what the First Amendment meant to the founding fathers and that's where we're locked in to that interpretation. You know, I get all sort of living constitutional model. Uh, so I don't view it as rewriting it. I view it as really interpreting the document for us today. Um, and I see freedom of speech, and I use that concept broadly. You know, we empower the protections of the Constitution over um, every little bit of new technology that comes up, all the things that um, uh, the media industry produces. Because I do feel that words are ideas. When you start regulating uh, the words people would say, you're regulating the ideas that they have. I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. Well, I think probably taking off on your question, it's true at the time of the uh, and ratification, and I am more of a believer in original meaning and what the what the uh, intent and meaning was to those who ratified the First Amendment. There was this notion of natural rights that um, that say freedom of speech was a natural right, but in the natural rights philosophy at the time, natural rights were not absolute. It wasn't that. They, they did not interpret them as sometimes the court now interprets them. In other words, natural rights were bounded by the rights of others. For instance, free speech then would be bounded by the reputational rights of others. So I wouldn't have a right to completely say whatever I want and damage the reputation or privacy of another and then claim that I had a right to do so. No, in the natural rights philosophy, there was the notion that the right, the natural right to speech, was bounded by the rights of others, so that it was not absolute, and it was very much, uh, very much bounded uh, in a way. So I do believe in that. I think that's another example of how the, we ought to look at the rights of free speech, for instance, within that particular scenario, rather than in just sort of an, in a, in sort of an absolute trump uh, on democracy. And so I'm, I'm a believer in that, but I think even if, if I were a believer in the living looking at the, um, the situation that we have today, I'd still continue to ask myself, why is it that one of the, one of the most you know, prominent growing industries in America is the media industry? Um, are we really going to interpret the First Amendment to, to almost give carte blanche freedom to that, uh, that um, uh, industry? Um, and I don't know how the issues may come up, but the point is, is that if everything becomes, and I still say it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine, I've read the court case, but it's hard for me to imagine what is it, what idea that graphic violent, graphically violent video games gives us that we, that, that we don't have anywhere else. Where's the idea? If we can't have some ways of democratically controlling this huge industry to the degree that we choose to control it within constitutional means, and that seems like taking the First Amendment and, and, and not having it all responsive to modern society. Other questions? Somebody? Um, all right, I guess with that, um, we can get... Yes, we do have a question. Excellent. Um, I was wondering, with the Westboro Church, if there were children involved at the funeral, like children who were Professor Gary, your position seems to rest on the harms to children with the violent graphic video games and bringing up. So if there are children that would their argument play into that, or how would you justify a harm done to the children there because West Virginia Church is characterizing it as core political speech, which you seem to really want to protect? Well, I, 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 it's not whether I want to protect it, it's what I guess it's that I think that the First Amendment clearly protects it. I, I don't think there's a question that the First Amendment clearly protects political speech. The question would be, does it give the highest protection to political speech, and, and then does it give lower protections to others? Uh, 
but in the context when you do have core politi political speech, and I can't grant it, it's difficult to determine, you know, the definitions of political speech. A lot of people have tried to do that. Um, but yet the courts, even though the courts recognize it's difficult to do that, the courts do do that in tort law, you know, in privacy law, and uh, uh, particularly in privacy law, talking about speech of public concern or speech of public interest. Um, but nonetheless, yes, I mean, if there, uh, that would depend upon a case-by-case uh, -case analysis in a tort setting, in other words. Um, I mean, I, I, if, if I would be open, I think, to an interpretation which, if, if speech really was, uh, and I don't have an answer for how it would be, but yeah, if it was really sort of aimed at tormenting and, and uh, injuring, children, or if that, uh, in a way of that funeral type of speech, then, then maybe there would be toward uh, ramifications for it. Um, I mean, granted, it, it, it's political speech, but it's also political speech in a different kind of, of setting. I don't know what kind of doctrine you could come up with that, but the only doctrine I see would be in the area of tort law. I don't know how you could regulate that other than I think it's, uh, perfectly acceptable, like, for instance, with funerals, to be able to uh, obviously have some kind of restrictions about who can protest at its funeral within a certain distance of that funeral. Ms. Raymond, do you have something to add to that? No, just the answer already sort of it embodies it, the, the difficulty you have trying to sort out what type of, uh, what is political speech and what is it, and then the uh, corresponding greater or less protections so I don't want to play that game. I think all speech is speech. It should also be protected at the highest level. Yes. I have another question. That's maybe something you could agree with. Why, why then are the courts not protecting political speech as much? It seems they, they want to differentiate between like maybe like this new technology, like, well, people blog and it seems like certain states are trying to pass initiatives to license bloggers that they have to pay the state a fee so they can blog but the state's real motivation is to try to limit their political speech rather than like these media monoliths are able to have a monopoly on what speech their editors find appealing. I don't know if you guys have uh, some thoughts on uh, that sort of difference and it seems like the courts are making today between you know Fox News or CNN or MSS, MSNBC and myself who just wants to share their, share their own views just because I don't have an 18th you know, century printing press but I want to use a blogging platform. They're trying to limit my speech. Since so image you with this pretty good one. <laughs> um, I hadn't really thought through that, that question. Um, I, I don't really um, think that the, well, I don't fear the states taxing bloggers to death as a way of trying to uh, control their, their access to speech. I'm not familiar with kind of what example you're thinking of, but um, I'm certainly in favor of a regulatory uh, administrative fee that's necessary that's tied to some benefits that their uh, blog would be getting from the state. But other than that, I can really see a valid reason for doing that. Yeah, on the other hand, I mean, I would say, wow, uh, that to me would be a clear violation of the First Amendment, if I'm singling, singling out bloggers for some kind of fee. Uh, a, a lot of uh, early uh, scholars uh, disputed. Blackstone said that the only thing that freedom of press would be protected against was prior restraint, the system of licensing, where we have to license newspapers or printers and then extract a tax from them. And this seemed to me to fit right into that as an extreme violation of that. So I'd, I'd say that's absolutely a violation, uh, unless it's a kind of a fee where maybe everybody is, is, um, uh, is um, paying the same kind of fee, but even then I think there might be a constitutional uh, uh, doctrine in which people, in which particular bloggers or, or bloggers or however it's applied, I don't know, I think the danger would be in how it's being applied, but that seems to, me to raise real questions. All right, with that, I guess we'll conclude. Uh, please join me in 